much for this, but I might. So we'll see how that works out. Normally I stand when I give presentations, but we've got, first of all, a nice couch here. <laughs> Plus, I kind of like to be able to look at the slides, and I'm not sure that I can really do it well standing over there. So let, let's see how this works. Many, 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 many years ago, I was a musician, trying to make my living at it, never did very well with it, and um, by playing at a folk festival at San Diego State. I used to have a folk festival before any of you were born. And <laughs> that was a long time ago, so I've been like 73 or 4. And uh, I was playing a little band, and the guys in the band, we all said, let's have them bring out a couch and a lamp and a coffee table and, and bring it out on stage. So we had them do that, and we got out and said, we know that when we're on stage, we never sound as good as when we're at home. And go, what's missing? So we need the furniture. So we all sat down on the couch and did our set sitting there. So I'm going to try that out here. I kind of for years now I've been wondering how to bring this into my into my software development talks, and now I've got a way to do it. So he's going to catch a picture, so I think that's interesting. How's that? How's that good? <laughs> I had years of uh, braces when I was a kid, so now finally at least we get a picture to show that at least this isn't as bad as it used to be. So my mom used to kid about me and say, oh, he can eat corn on the cob through and pick a fence. <laughs> so, okay, well, so I got braces. Okay, guys, um, so I'm Woody Zool. I'm going to talk about mob programming, which we call a whole team approach. Uh, you've heard of pair programming, and this is very similar to pair programming. I should ask, does anybody here do pair programming in your work? No. Anybody at all? Not at all. <laughs> You, ha you actually have, like, you split a cubicle and you program on one over there and one over there? <laughs> yeah. Nobody talks to each other. Okay, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> so, a lot of this might not be familiar, but you guys know what pair programming is, right? Okay. But you don't do it at all, huh? Done a bit. A little bit, oh, yeah. yeah. No? All right, well, let's talk about this. Um, so, I work for this company, Hunter Industries. Hunter Industries makes sprinklers so to speak. They're a manufacturing company. Um, I don't know exactly how many employees they have, maybe 2,000. But the reason I show this slide, first of all, is because um, I told my boss I would include the slide, and that way he kind of supports me when I go out and do these things. And also, um, I want to make the point of their little tagline there, built on innovation. When I went to work for them, one of the things, one of the reasons I decided to go to work for them was because they really heavily uh, push this idea of built on innovation, and most of what I do I consider to be pretty innovative. Not so much in the code that I write, but in the way I think about going about making software. So um, I was looking for a place that sort of buys into the idea. At least if they say they're built on innovation, they can't complain if I'm trying to innovate. So uh, they're really good people. They're a great place to work. We're not hiring any developers right now, but if you know somebody who is looking for a job, they always have a lot of jobs. Uh, no programming ones right now, but all kinds of stuff in manufacturing and management and all kinds of things. Very good company to work for. Family owned, been there a little over 30 years in San Marcos. It's up in North County. And I'll make a really strong point. They almost never fail to give a bonus every year. This last year the bonus was 13%. The best they've had, which was just before I got there, about two or three years, was 27%. So that's a dang good bonus. <laughs> Dang good books, but it's a, it's a privately held company. And part of the way that they do things is that everybody shares the same percent uh, based on their salary. So I think that's a pretty cool thing. I've had bonuses at other places I've worked, so that's enough on them, but they're a good place. They have a good photographer, too. <laughs> so I've got a story to tell, and this is about the most important thing. Um, but we've got about 25 people here, and each one of you are going to come up with your own idea of what the most important thing is out of this talk. But I'll try along the way to tell you what I think the most important thing is. Oh, by the way, all the art in here is done by my wife, Andrea. Andrea is a, a children's book artist, and what she does is she'll, she'll do little sketches for her portfolio or for a proposal. And when I see one that I like, I ask her if I can use it. So she doesn't do any of these drawings for me but she lets me use some of them when I, when I want to do a talk. So these were all stolen from her. <laughs> She's really, I think, a great artist, and hopefully you'll agree. If you don't, just keep that to yourself. <laughs> so this is what mob programming is to me. 
It's all the brilliant mind working on the same thing at the same time in the same space. So that's what agile software development is. Does anybody do anything like agile software development here? Does anybody? Show of hands? Four or five. It's sort of starting to become pervasive, maybe. But and to me, this is what agile software development is about. It's the idea that we're keeping everybody working kind of on the same thing, so we're not separate, separated by time, not separated by what we're working on, and we're not separated by geographical location or space. But this adds one more thing to it. We're all using the same computer. So this is why it's mob programming. It's like pair programming, but with more than two people. A three people makes a very small mob, but that's okay. So this is what it looks like from the front. And this is what it looks like from the back. So basically what we have here is a bunch of people. These are all the people who work on this team with me. You can see me standing there. I usually stand, I usually sit over in the corner. You can kind of see uh, there's a, a computer flipped open there. That's where I normally sit. But I wanted it to kind of get in the picture so it just didn't look like my hands. So I moved over there. But what we had done is we put one of those time lapse, not time lapse, but a, you know, a, a, like hung an iPad in the corner and had it clicking the picture off every few seconds so that we could try and get one where we all looked somewhat pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> this was about the best one. That's our actual work area. And this is what it looks like from the back. And you can see we've got a regular, uh, what you call information radiators, so to speak, a whiteboard where we put our tasks, other uh, papers there where we have the retrospectives we've done. And stuff like that. So it's a regular work area. We always sit in this area all the time. It's where we work all day long. So I'm going to show you a video of this. Some of you have seen this. So let's go ahead and do this. This might not work too well for you who are trying to film this thing. Oh, you know, all my icons moved around because of the, uh, <coughs> you know how that happens, so i got to find where it is. That's okay, there it is. Yeah, so I'll talk about this for a second. There's no sound to this, so you don't need to worry about that. Call us a model pro team programming. Now that we say this technique, um, we've achieved 10 times productivity, we'll talk about that maybe. We, we work eight hours a day. We spend the first hour with a skills learning session where we where we actually pick some topic that we're gonna that we're trying to learn about, and we spend the whole hour, um, most days, learning whatever that is. Now we're into it. We've got a dual projectors. We've got a single computer. You saw that in the picture. We have a person who's called the driver, and everybody else, so to speak, is called the navigator. You'll see that the driver moves every 15 minutes. We have a different person as the driver. You know what, I'm going to put this on hold for just a second to mention something. These guys are great. What's that? <laughs> the PM said these guys are great. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he is a nice guy, too. He's a nice guy. And um, we put that in there just to spook him. Um, <laughs> so you notice that there's a blurry person in the pictures here, right? Yeah. Uh, I, people ask about that, so I want to um, mention that. This person asked to not be shown that day. They weren't happy with their appearance. So it took me four hours to blur that thing. Because <laughs> you can buy a little software pro uh, app that will follow an image. You know, once you select it, it kind of follows it around and blurs it. But because this was time lapse, it wouldn't do that. So I did that because I promised I would do that. And Luella and I sat there wow. four stinking hours, <laughs> blurring the dang thing out. You know? so, actually, that person's really lovely, and and. I couldn't tell any difference from the day before or the day after. But some people just aren't comfortable with how they look. Look at me, I don't care. <laughs> I am what I am. Okay, so, but everybody always asks about that, so I thought I'd point it out. Everybody else we call a navigator. Everybody dr uh, navigates uh, and drives as well. Uh, even sometimes the people who come in and, and uh, act as our product owners do. We have a manager coach. Um, that's me. And. So the customer is gone. They're usually with us for an hour or so a day because uh, they have their jobs they need to go do. So we just sit and work. This is what it looks like. I really wanted to show this whole thing. It's only three minutes. So you can put up with that. It's like your boss comes to your cubicle and starts talking with you. You go, yeah, 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 and he's just talking. So, that's, so this is the same thing. Sometimes we go off and do some solo work by Dr. Pepper. <laughs> um, 
So you can see we're kind of active. We're moving around a lot. Some of us, like old guys, we just sit there all day, but everybody else is moving around a lot. We take an hour for lunch. Normally during lunch, we go out and take a hike. We have a bunch of hills near us. We're up in San Marcos. Right around where we're at, there's a lot of hills we can go hike on. Actual dirt trails. We've even seen rattlesnakes and coyotes and whatever out there. No mountain lions yet. They said there was one out there the other day. And then about the end of lunch, people come in and get caught up on a few emails maybe. And then we're back to work. So this is what it looks like. We're kind of roaming in. It's 1 o'clock. It'll be too soon enough. The team works as a team. We'll talk about that a little later. Everybody's more or less happy all the time. We're not giddy, you know, but we're happy. And um, let's see if I have any other notes in here. Oh, we, you'll see there's other computers around, but there's only one computer into which the code is going. Everybody sort of stays engaged. You can drift in and out if you need to. But it's, it's not easy, you know, when you're just sitting alone at your desk to keep attention span all day long. It's hard to do even with a group. But we have enough people working on stuff that we don't worry about that too much. So all the expertise needed for programming is in this room almost all the time. And this is what we said at the beginning. All brilliant people working on the same problem, <coughs> the same thing at the same time, and at the same computer. This has made me famous. This has gone viral. There's over 5,000 views of this. Over 5,000. It's like nothing on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> well, this actually is on my own desktop, so it doesn't count. And I've watched it like a hundred times. Okay, so let's see if we can keep going. Try and keep the pace up. So that was the video. Uh, usually people have questions about this time, but what I did is I took all the questions that people normally ask, and I've actually put slides in for each one. So we'll try to cover everything. If we get to the end and we haven't answered the question you have, I'll be happy to do that. And then I'll add it to the next slide pack so I won't keep getting that question. There is one that people start asking uh, now, so I haven't added it yet. I'll cover it somewhere along the way. But it's, um, what would be the ideal number for the number of people on, on it? Model? I don't know why, they always want to ask that. So here's something we believe. I want to really share this. <coughs> This is an idea that I learned many years ago, and I've modified it slightly for software. The object isn't to make great software. It's to be in that wonderful state which makes great software inevitable. In other words, if we really set out to do something, sometimes it's better to just be really prepared to make it easy to do that thing, and it becomes a lot less important to just be doing that thing. That's sort of what this is about, is just being in that state of mind or having the environment in place where it's really easy to be effective. That goes for programming, but for a lot of other things, because this came from Robert Henry, who was an art teacher. And this, if you read it this way, the object isn't to make art, it's to be in that wonderful state which makes art inevitable. And I think that's a profound thing. When you set out to do something, often you're not gonna get nearly the results <coughs> that you would get you put everything in place to make doing that thing super easy to do. So if we focus more of our time on having that environment in place and making it easy to work well, we, can, we need to concern ourselves a lot less with the actual thing that we're trying to do. I could, talk, I could do a whole talk on this, and I actually will be at a conference coming up. Um, and we'll soon see little snippets of it. This is part of what that most important story is that I'm trying. Am I speaking loud enough for everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Now I want to tell you guys something. Just so you know, I am a really awkward speaker in front of people. Some of you know me because I've been speaking at music groups and stuff. It's not too hard to speak in front of a bunch of also awkward speakers, which is what programmers are. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, sometimes I get stuck and I just can't go on. And it only happens rarely, but if it does, Paul or somebody will have to come over and kind of give me a nudge. Say, okay, hey, Woody, <laughs> calm down. And because something just gets inside me and I just can't get started on it. So the reason I like it. You, you're in a nice, relaxed couch. This is pretty nice right now. Don't fall asleep. So I just want to make that. It's usually a disclaimer I give. Um, the reason I'm bringing that up, though, is that um, as programmers, 
uh, and people in software, we need to share the things that we're learning with each other. So we've got to be able to do some of this somehow. So that's why I started doing it, and I'm inviting you to do that as well. So let's go on. Oh, by the way, that's a painting that he made on the, on the side there, just so you can see the subject he did. He was of the, uh, what they called the trash can, I think it was, um, movement. And he was in the Tau School of Art, where he taught a lot and wrote a lot. So I like to ask this question, why would we work this way? So this is the audience participation. Why would we work this way? Share ideas. Share ideas. Everybody has a different viewpoint on the particular problem. Everybody has a different viewpoint. They could bring their strengths to it. Create synergy. Create synergy. It's truly collaborative. It's what? It's yeah. true collaboration. Yeah. It's really collaborative. Gets people thinking in different ways. Gets people thinking in different ways. You don't want to get programmers thinking too different. They're already kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, Make sure nobody, you know, gets lazy and puts in a hack or a shortcut. Or the quality goes way up because they'll have got a lot of eyes on the code. Ideas tend to spark more ideas. Ideas tend dominant, to spark more ideas. Dang, you guys could write the book. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to cover all those things. What's yeah. that? You don't need this uh, code review? Yeah, you're automatically code reviewing review. the whole time. That's exactly right. These are all what I would consider really great benefits of working this way. So this is a very agile concept that we're going to see here. We would work this way because the team decided to work this way. It's a team decision. This was something the people who are doing the work decided to do. It wasn't that because somebody told them this is how they should work. I really want to make that a strong point here. This is what Agile, in my opinion, Agile software development is about. Is that the people that we hire are really smart and they can figure a lot of stuff out and we put roadblocks in their way. Keeps them from being able to work well. When they can figure out how to best work, each team is going to be different, of course. But we worked this way because the team decided to, no other reason. All those benefits that you see, we'll learn about those in a minute. So how can we work this way? So I won't ask that question, but you can see each one of these has got a question, these are things people ask. So the first thing that we noticed about this was to be able to work this way, we had to get along. So agile software development is about this, one of the principles or one of the values actually is, it's about individuals and interactions over processes. We need to have a way to keep all the individuals who are involved doing the best they can as much as possible. And since they're working with each other, we have to have a way to make those interactions work really, really well. So any way we can find to do that is a good thing. Now, I like to use this slide. Again, my wife made all these. She didn't make this for me. But this shows how kids are, right? You got, how many of you have kids? Does anybody here have kids? Some programmers actually procreate. <laughs> I've got a kid. Kids never play this way. You know, the one little kid's going to be stealing the book from the girl instead of reading it to her. He's not really reading it anyways. He's pretending to read. He doesn't know how to read yet. The other girl in the back is going to pull the other girl's hair. The little girl with the block is going to be hitting the boy, not handing the block to him. The little girl in front would be grabbing the rest of the blocks and running away. The little kid in the back is doing a expensive report, I guess. <laughs> so here's the thing, even little kids know when we get along with each other, we can have more fun. Now, not every little kid knows that. But when they catch on to that idea, that if we just share and at least every now and then, we can have more fun. So we learned this. This is kind of where we started. This is fundamental. We treat each other with kindness, consideration, and respect, which is very rare in the workplace. But it's really important to be able to work together all day long. We've been doing this almost three years, two and a half years. And we work every day like this. You've got to have these things. It's really hard in the workplace. And I am the worst at this stuff. I am a cantankerous, frustrated, easily frustrated kind of guy. But when you work with other people who have all dedicated themselves to be kind and considerate and showing respect, it's sort of like do unto others as they would have you do unto you. You kind of start feeling it. You just have to get better. So that's sort of part of what, what this is. It, it helps me be a better person by working with people who are also trying to be kind to me, and it reflects back. 
I'm kind of there. But just saying we work this way isn't everything. So we have this thing we call the driver navigator. So I showed you, we talked about a little bit about the philosophy. We talked a little bit about a practice we use. And we're going to talk a little bit about a tool we use. This is just some of the things we do. And if this starts getting boring to you, I don't mind if you take a nap. Right? <laughs> or you can leave. You will not hurt my feelings if you fit in sleep. Okay, we have this thing we call driver navigator. This is one of the things Lil and I have been using for years. I think in 2009, we started doing this. Now, I think he used the driver navigator long before I did, so I probably learned it as well. It's a way of pair programming where the person with the idea hands the keyboard to the other person. So if I have an idea that I want to get into the computer, then I give the keyboard to the other person. And I tell them my idea. We'll talk about that in a minute. But by telling them the idea, it forces me to express it clearly. <laughs> Maybe with a whiteboard. You saw that we have whiteboards in our area. We, have, we also just got a brand new six foot one, so we have more space to write on. By having us have to express our ideas out loud, we get a lot of clarity that we don't get when we just think in code. I'll kind of emphasize that. Code is a lousy place to think. Code, we have to really think about how can the computer understand what I want it to do, but that's not where we need to think about business problems and most of the problems with the software development. It does, it's not, we shouldn't be thinking in code. We should open out to a much bigger part of humanity where we're thinking about how these things interact. Code is very specific, not a good place to think about these more general and bigger ideas. So we have the driver. The driver is like a smart input device. The keyboard is sort of a dumb input device. The driver knows how to use the code base or the code environment we have, so they can type in write code most of the time. <coughs> Some of them have trouble with that, we can talk about that too. Um, but programming isn't writing code. Programming is the ideas that we need to express through code. Code is just the way we get it into the computer. If we could do it like on Star Trek, you know, computer, you know, then we would do it that way. And some people do, I guess, nowadays. Does that make sense? Typing is just the way we get the, what we want the computer to do. And code is just the way, the, the method we have for doing it, where it used to be a machine language where people just flip switches, and then punch cards, and then later assembly, and so on and so on. We're at a very high level now. We'll go higher soon, probably. It's just where it happens to be right now. But that's not what programming is. Programming is the, the thinking that goes into it. It's not even knowledge work a lot of the time. It's the ability to think really well. We have to know a lot of stuff, but that changes all the time. Let's go on. Then we got all those people who are doing the thinking. We separate out the idea of the guy who's doing the, nav the driving from the navigators. We want that person to be just taking all those ideas and getting it in the computer. Allow everyone else to do the thinking for the moment. When the navigators switch up, the driver switches up, in 15 minutes, the driver will become a navigator. So let's see, I've made this really fantastic animation. Be prepared to be amazed. <laughs> that is the keyboard. We talked about that a minute ago. Okay. And did I just shut this off? I think I broke my animation. Wow. There it is. There. <laughs> Slides right in. And the driver, which kind of looks like this, <laughs> is sitting at the keyboard. And then we have the navigators. That's everybody else, including the driver. We switch it up every 15 minutes. That happens to be the way this team works. We used to do these coding dojos, and probably did one at, at this group once sometime a long time ago, I imagine where we would usually switch up about every four minutes. But we found right now that 15 minutes works really well for us. We don't necessarily recommend it, it's just what we do. Somebody takes the driver's position, and then every 15 minutes, we switch it up. And you look at this, I'm not clicking anything. <laughs> that amazing? You can make PowerPoint do some pretty cool stuff. It takes you hours to put something like this. <laughs> I just do a lot of work in Flash. It's a lot easier in Flash. Good thing you'd have to blur one of those faces. <laughs> yeah. I actually do that. I like that. I'll steal that idea. Thank you. 
So this is the basic idea of it. And then once we've gone through our rotation, we bring the same person back in. So we basically use what we call the same rotation. That kind of keeps it steady throughout the day, where it's nobody's going, whose turn is it next, whatever. So this is our basic work pattern. You don't need to do it this way, but a lot of teams so far that I've seen picking up on um, uh, programming follow something similar to this, because they probably learned it from us. You can figure out your own way if you wanted to. OK, so let's go on. One other thing is a tool. So we have our pattern of thinking. There's a pattern of how we work. And now a pattern uh, of a tool that we use. So these are three things I'm sharing with you. What this is about was we start off with a timer, very much like this. And I would just set the time on it. And what we found is when the timer went off, we kind of ignored it. The person at the keyboard, this is a problem with programmers, and you might see it with pair programming. Once someone's got the keyboard, they just want to keep the keyboard. They don't want to release it. You know? So why is that? You know? So you have to be able to just release from the keyboard. So with the timer, the people, we wouldn't do that. And then we forget. And then, oh, I forgot to put the timer. on. So I decided, well, maybe we need a better timer. I got one of those really nice little square kitchen timers that really beep out really loud. And that didn't work so well for us either. Because we, even though it was loud, we would still ignore it. And we'd just keep beep, 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 you know, and we would just be ignoring it. And then one day, one of the guys on the team was walking across our work area. We have a big open work area. We're out in a corner. We were actually in a little room at that time. And somebody on the other end goes, what is that alarm beeping? It keeps going off every few minutes. It's just driving me crazy. So he ran back over and said, we've got to stop using that. So he went off on his own and in about an hour wrote this tool. What this does is it just blinks off the screen. And I'll kind of stand up to show you. We have a button that we push right here that adds all of us to this list. Bling. And then we can type in extra people and add them in there. It randomizes it. And then we hit this timer button. We set the whatever time we want. We usually use 15 minutes. And then it, instead of say switch it up, we'll say like Dexter, sit at the keyboard. And so when this comes up, it just blinks out the keys. It blinks out the screen. You can't keep typing. It doesn't do you any good. So people just learn to break the habit of being at the keyboard. It worked out really well. So that's what we did. So these are three of the ways, the things that we have that help us work this way. What do you, you know call what? that tool? What's that? What do you call that tool? This timer is just our timer. Oh, uh, OK. I wasn't sure if you yeah. like we're, we're actually making an open source version of it, because a lot of people have asked about that. So that will probably be available sometime in the next two to three years. It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot. It's, another, it's just one of those things where uh, finding the moment to do it, because I don't think it'd take more than 15 minutes to get it all set up. Um, so, this is another question almost everybody asks How can we be productive with five people at one keyboard? And I have no idea. I don't know. Um, we got a huge spike in productivity ourselves. But that was based on the idea that um, there were a lot of jammed up projects that had kind of stalled out. And once we started working this way, we noticed that stalls didn't happen anymore. But I've talked to other teams who've had a little bit of a productivity increase and some none at all. I haven't talked to any teams yet that have been trying this who said, yeah, I guess everything went bad. We, we weren't getting anything done. I don't think that would happen. Depends on the work you're doing. Might depend on how many people you have. We'll talk about those things. Here's what we noticed. So why, I don't know. How, I don't know. This is what we noticed. We had five or six people on our team, and they were turning out some work. And after we started doing this, this is what we started getting. We don't really do metrics on our work, so it's the closest we get to metrics. But I took that picture. I took a bunch of stuff. We have a bucket where we put all the cards when they're done, you know, when we took, finish a task. I pulled them out, put them on the desk, took a picture so I could do this slide. And one of the guys on the team said, did you notice that every card in there is within a two to three day period? That's a lot of stuff to get done in two to three days. And that's the way it goes with us. We just pull something off and get it done. Pull something off and get it done. Every day, we just go through a whole bunch of work. So we're sensing this is really productive. The people who do the work for are very happy with the amount of work we're turning on. If we had to prove that this was better than some other method, I'm not sure that I could. I don't know how people prove anything about how productive they are with software development. 
you know, every project we do is different, every task we do is different. Someone will come in and say, how long will it take to do this? And one guy will say two hours, and someone else will say four hours, and someone will say two days. There's nothing scientific about any of this yet. I don't think it will be for a long time. How in the world could you prove any of these things? Does, does one of these yellow cards, is this one equivalent to one of these yellow cards? You know, how do we know? We can kind of say, look at them and say, well, that's sort of similar to that job to this. But who's working on it? What specifically was it? How, how hidden was the logic? Did we understand enough about it? A lot of companies try to figure that stuff out. So I'm kind of on the other side of that. So let's just get work done. Maybe after we die, someone will figure this all out. I'm sorry, were you, were you saying that that pile is your done pile? Yeah, that's work that we got done. You see these red marks are the date that the thing got done. So it was April 17th, April 17th, April 17th, April 18th. It's a little blurry, but... Okay, so you just noticed a larger pile of work. Well, yeah, I just took out some, pic some cards to take a picture with. This was probably the equivalent of something that close to a week, maybe four days worth of work, with the, the way the team was working before. We'll talk about why. So this is what it is about to me. And I'm going to ask you this question. So audience participation. What are the things that destroy productivity? Sorry, I'm getting a message here. <laughs> Distractions. Yeah, distractions. 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 What else? Oh. Disinterest. Lack of disinterest. Lack of communication. Bad communication. Get stuck on something. Get stuck on something. Tangents? Tangents. No. Going down a rabbit hole. I got a job once where my main job was to keep the guy who was really brilliant from going down rabbit holes. <laughs> he would get on a thread and he would go down that thing till it was three o'clock in the morning. And when he should have just stopped at the beginning, he said, "No, I've gone, I've gone three steps already. I'm not going to go 130 more." You know, he should have just stopped. So my job was say, "Let's get focused back on this for a while." Pretty good job. Anyways, what else? What blocks productivity? Reddit. 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 <laughs> like Twitter or whatever. Misallocation. Somebody Misallocation. Yeah. Not knowing what to do. Yeah. Not knowing what to do. Or not understanding the problem correctly. Not understand the problem correctly. Or thinking you understand the problem correctly. <laughs> yeah. It's like doing the right thing. Until two weeks later. Right? Or you know, if we're doing the right thing, we're okay. But if we're doing the wrong thing, it doesn't matter how, but how, how we well we do it, right? That's right. If we got it done this week, what else? Frustration. Frustration. Just being okay. That. Let's go back to this one. I put these pictures on purpose. You know, she's getting ready to cry. He's already given up. He or she has zoned out. There's this one super genius. He's got four <laughs> monitors. You know, and what is he really doing though? He's They're thinking about. You know, that looks like Scott. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so <laughs> exactly. There's too many things that get in our way. We have to be able to get through our day productively. Productu productively? Yes. Somebody yes. say the word. That's it. Productively. Okay. I mess up with words so often. <coughs> My wife's just giving up on me. <laughs> so, you guys have mentioned most of them, so I'm going to show you. These were a short list. We talked about this on my team once. We made a list of like 40 things that are blocking productivity. I put communication problems at the top because I think that that's a huge passive thing right there. Is passive even a word? Decision-making problems. That's a huge one. We'll talk about all these in a minute. Doing more than what's barely sufficient. Sometimes they call it gold plating, but often it's all kinds of other things. We never need more than barely sufficient. The minute you do something more than barely sufficient, you're doing something you don't actually need. Simplicity is what it's about. Technical debt. I don't think anybody brought that up. Technical debt is like one of the worst productivity uh, destroyers. We start off a project, everything's great. A week later, everything's great. Two weeks, things start slowing down. Three weeks, they get slower. Now we're doing hacks on top of hacks. Now somebody's saying that that architecture is really lousy, I have to rewrite everything. You know, that's kind of the way it goes on these projects. We lose a lot of our productivity through just technical debt slowing us down. Thrashing, I don't know if we mentioned that. You guys know what thrashing is? Do you remember with hard drives? Do you remember hard drives? They used to have these little physical disk things in our computer. When, when, when they get fragmented, what happened? Yeah, they 
thrash. They thrash. <laughs> that hard drive head is moving all over the place just to get a little bit of data because it's been placed all over the disk instead of in blocks of data. So you have to move all over the place. You can hear it. You, you remember those sounds? <laughs> all the time. Okay, that's what thrashing is. Thrashing for humans is the vice president comes in and says, hey, Bill, can you come help us for a minute? We're getting ready for this trade show. So the next three days, Bill's gone. Why did they take Bill out of the area, by the way? Why did they come and choose Bill? Because he's the smart one. He's the one that they know will get this done. What does that do to the rest of the team? He's the go-to guy, right? All they've got left is like, what do you, you know? <laughs> what, how are we going to get this done now? I, I'm really serious about that. I've seen that happen over and over. I was even with the team once where um, we made a buddy system. As soon as you see a vice president walking across the open space, this was two jobs back, somebody would get up and go over and sit next to the genius guy. So when the vice president goes there, could you just wait a minute because I've got this thing I'm working on. Could you come back in a half hour? You know, we'd be putting him off. <laughs> so he wasn't actually working with them. It's just, he was a decoy kind of a thing. So the problem with the thrashing is that it happens in at least 10 or 15 different ways. That's just one of them. Say, oh wait, guys, stop. We're not gonna work on this. This other more important thing just came in. These are all thrashings, and there's many of them. Politics, I can't help you with, but politics is one of the worst things in teams. We'll talk a little bit about it. Meetings, nobody brought up meetings. That's almost always the first one somebody says. <laughs> meetings, does anybody have problems with productivity based on meetings? Oh, yeah. Anybody here? Mm -hmm. I've worked at places where you spend more time in meetings than you did in doing the work you're supposed to be doing. How in the world are we supposed to get stuff done? But why do we have meetings? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. They're important to have, but dang, we've got to be careful about it in destroying our productivity. But here's what we found. You see, if we're in a couch, we can do it like this. Here's what we found. <laughs> I like this. Can I take this with me, guys? You can come back. Okay. In April. <laughs> Here's what we found. Um, we didn't set out to solve these problems. We noticed them going away. We didn't set out to solve these problems by doing something new, which we're going to learn about from our program. What we found was that once we started doing this, all these problems disappeared. Almost all these problems. Almost. So. After about six months of doing this, I was at a conference, and somebody came up and asked me, this guy, Llewellyn, had mentioned that you guys are doing this thing all the time where you work like a code dojo. I said, yeah. And then somebody else came up, somebody else came up. So I had told three people about it. I said, I'm not going to do this all day. I said, the guy sent me some slides, and I'll start showing you. We'll set up a little time during a, a day of the open space, the Agile conference, the big one. And so, I asked the guys to make a list of the benefits of doing this. And they put together this list of the benefits. It wasn't the problems. It was like, oh, we noticed this, we noticed that. And then it like a light went off on our head. Why did we keep doing this? We decided to do it because, we'll tell you a little about that, about that story. We decided to do it because, um, because we noticed some benefits the first day we did it. It was by accident, and I'll explain what we did. But we kept doing it because these benefits started showing up more and more and more. And we couldn't pull ourselves away from them. It's like, this is working good. It's kind of like an accident, you know. You guys believe in death, you just can't look away. So, not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? It was like, we didn't set out to solve these problems. We just kept doing something that was working good for us, and it ended up solving a bunch of problems. So it's kind of like maybe somebody, they're not happy with their weight, but they've got all kinds of other medical issues, but they lose a lot of weight because they just don't want to look too tubby, you know? And all of a sudden, all those other medical issues go away for them. Their high blood pressure goes down, perhaps, and stuff like that. So you take care of something, and it gives you other good effects. So let's see about these things. I've got a slide on each one of these, but I'm only going to cover them a little bit, because we only have an hour or two. And I used to do a talk on some of these things, like the thrashing, the technical debt, and the communication problems are things I used to have whole 
workshops on. So I can say a lot about these things. But I'm going to cover one little bit of each one. So here's the thing with communication problems. Again, my wife's the artist. I love these pictures. It's cool. Um, this one's called something like um, Little Bun is Itching for a Fight. I think that's what it's called. And so sometimes the, the programmers, when I ask them, they think that the bear is the programmers and the little rabbit is like the manager. And then when I shut the managers, the managers seem to like, the bear is the manager, and the little rabbit is the programmer. So, but it doesn't really have any meaning. Here's the thing with the, it's, it's just the communication problem. This, I'll give you one example of a type of communication problem. I was working in a job for a large company here in San Diego that a lot of you will know of, so I won't mention any names. And um, they hired me for a three-month contract to write a Windows service. Do, do any of you work in Windows anymore? It used to be an operating system. <laughs> do you know what a Windows service is? You know what I'm talking about? It's like something like, like a daemon or whatever they call them. They call them demons or daemons or something. Like Same thing in the Unix world. OK, anybody can write one of those. What's the difficult thing about software? Debugging. Well, that's difficult, yes. But it's the business logic. The code itself, if you, once you learn how to write a Windows service, you can write a Windows service. It's just writing some code. But knowing what it's supposed to do, that's the difficult part. And everybody writes out those big requirements documents. But what are requirements documents? But a bunch of paper that you can misinterpret easily. And that's what happens with them. So they assigned a guy to me who was sort of the inventor of this thing we were going to be doing. And he was a very important person at this company. It's a big company with more than 100 developers, probably more than a couple hundred. And I was allowed to speak with this person one hour every Monday. So I started the job. I met with the guy. I got the details of what we're doing, got the document, read the document, started coding, and I had a question. So I went to my boss and said, hey, I've got a question. Hey, you can't talk to him until next Monday because he's off doing other stuff. We can't disturb him. We get one hour a week. So what am I supposed to do? Well, just gather up your questions. So guys, does that work? Girls. Does that work? <laughs> I really, I'm, I get, folks, does that work? <laughs> does it work? Can you save up questions when you're working on software like that? If you have five different things you're working on, maybe. Oh, I'll switch off of this. I blocked on this, I'll switch off of this. I blocked on this, I'll switch off of this. I got hired for a three month contract, right? How long did it take me? Six months. Six stinking months. That is like the rule. Six months, if you take a three month contract, it will last for six months, but that's only because you're gonna quit after the six months. <laughs> you're gonna try to suck you in for another three months. It really, on this one, it was exactly that. How long would have it taken me if I could have gotten my questions answered within a minute or two of getting the question? How long would it take me? Two months. Two months. Any other guesses? Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> okay, what I did, do you, has anybody done a value stream map? You know what a value stream map is? Anything that's adding value is on the top. Anything that's not adding value is on the bottom. You just switch between. We're getting work done. Oh, we're not getting work done. We're getting work done. We're not getting work done. That's a value stream map. Well, I value stream map this thing. Two weeks. Just a little bit under two weeks, I would have had it done. They paid me for six months, and I went to my boss almost every day. I just need to ask him some questions. Don't worry, that's just the way we do things here. That's an alert, by the way. I should put it in this slide. Whenever somebody says that, that means there's high dysfunction. When they say, well, that, don't worry, that's just the way we do things here. It means we've given up. <laughs> that's just one kind of communication problem. So let's talk about decision-making problems. The first part of decision-making problems is decisions can be very difficult to make, and we start becoming reluctant to make them. So we have lots of meetings. We have lots of emails. We make sure we get our boss's signatures on the emails. So they got communicated with, everybody's getting communicated with back and forth. We spend a lot of time making simple decisions because we know, I like this drawing. That poor little crab knows if he tries to eat that worm, there's a good chance there's something connected to it that will kill him. <laughs> and that's what often happens. He can't see beyond the worm here, but he knows that there's usually something nasty nearby because he lives in the ocean. So, and I think an octopus can pretty much rip a crab apart and the octopus has got a beak and crack the thing open. As developers, that happens to us all the time. 
<laughs> so we're reluctant to make the decisions. We bring a lot of people in. We have a lot of meetings, and we act like it's really a big deal. But we're just trying to cover ourselves. So what happens once we've made the decision? I'll go ahead and ask that. What happens after we've made the decision? Now what do we do? We prepare ourselves well to protect ourselves in case it was a bad decision or something goes wrong. So now we have to defend ourselves. We defend our decision until the last second when we have to finally admit, no, it was a bad decision. So this is a self-portrait of my wife. She's waiting for me to get home, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but you notice, as time goes by, she's becoming more and more irrational, <laughs> right? She's got the shotgun out, and she's got her manager or whatever who's really mad to do battle because they all signed off on this thing. We protect those dang decisions we made. So the first one about the communications, like she said, we resolve most of the communication problems because we are in that room together. We can ask each other questions. And we engage our product managers or our product owners, whatever we want to call them, as being part of our team. So we can get those answers every day. And we actually tell them, if you are not available when we have a question to ask, but we can't just phone you up and get an answer right away, we'll consider that a blocking situation, and we might move off to something else. And you might not get our attention for a while. So you have to be available all the time. And they commit to that, and that's how we get our work done. The way we solve this is we don't care about bad decisions anymore. Any bad decision we make, we can unmake easily. Any bad, any bad decision we make, we made it with all the rest of the people who are interested in the decision. So we're not worried about somebody snapping our head off for doing something wrong. Let's look at this just a little bit. If you are really furious about something, it's like, I'm going to grab him, I'm going to tar and feather him and run him out of town. Can you do that? You can't do it. Before this guy grabs somebody and tars and feathers him, somebody's going to calm him down or they'll arrest him and he won't get anything done. But can you calm this down? You can't. They just say, yeah, let's do it. And before they know they've made a bad decision, they've tarred and feathered the wrong guy and got him out of town. The thing is, tomorrow they go, oops, we made a mistake. And nobody's going, it was your fault. It was your fault. It was all of our fault, so it doesn't matter. We just move on quickly. That's how we resolve this. We have almost no decision-making problems whatsoever. The barely sufficient thing. So how do I put in bare necessity just because it's kind of tied in nicely? But um, what I've noticed is not so much developers gold plating stuff. But I've noticed a lot of product owner types always wanting more stuff and more stuff. And in this scenario, we work really hard at just getting the, a few things done and getting them out the door. So we try to deliver something every day if we can. Some of our projects, we can do it two or three times a day. It goes into production. So we'll show this next slide. We work with our product owners carefully for this. Give us something that you know is valuable. I don't care if it's the most valuable. This prioritization stuff to me, whole nother talk, is a bunch of baloney. All we have to know is this, is that something you want? Do you really want it? This is like for Christmas. Give me the 20 things you want, and I'm going to try and get them all for you. You might be able to get that one. You might not be able to get that one. Let's just get some stuff done. You'll know within a few days whether that thing was really valuable to you or not. For, so it's always just something of potential value. But we work really hard at just doing the bare necessities. Have we run out of time already? Are we supposed to be done now? No. no, not necessarily. Okay. So that's how we solve that. We don't do things we don't need to do. And we've got a whole team watching that every minute. The technical debt thing. So I, I liked this picture. It was part of a sketch my wife was doing a thing about. She's really, um, she has a weight problem. I have a weight problem. And um, so this was just a story she was doing about herself, but I saw this as being good for technical debt because we always hear the term of garbage in, garbage out. But with, with technical debt, it's garbage in, garbage stays. It's always there. You know, once you got it in, it stays up until it's, I even had projects where there were bugs in the project that got migrated to the new version of the project. You know, when they were rewriting it, I actually had that. Well, that's the way it works right now, but that's wrong. You can't change it. You can move it over. So here's the trouble with technical debt. Once it's in the code, it never gets out, so let's not put it in. So if we have continuous scrutiny on things, we're almost always getting rid of the technical debt. 
There's a lot more to this, though. The technical excellence part of it, which is a real big, important part of agile software development, we wanted to have sustainable pace. And one of the ways we could do sustainable development is by always being able to work quickly on our code. Get rid of technical debt, always have technical excellence. So, just as an example, if we have five people working on the code base, and in the morning they meet for 15 minutes. So what do you call it when you got 15 minutes, you're just talking about stuff, you know, that's a carpool, right? So you're all driving to work, and then we drop off. It's not a meeting. I don't even, do you guys do stand-ups? Who here does stand-ups? A lot of people do stand-ups. Okay. There's not enough time to scrutinize through code reviews and everything the patterns that are in the code that we're writing. These patterns are really important. <clears throat> so if there's five people and one person's working on something that's slightly similar, a little different to something someone else is working on, that's a little different, slight, but slightly similar to something someone else is working on, none of us are able to see the pattern. Because we don't know what the pattern might be. Because we're not seeing enough of it. But here, something comes in front of the team. We're only working on how many things at one time. One thing at a time. And we're all looking at it. When we see that first one come in, we go, hey, that's kind of a neat thing, and we write it. The next one, hey, that was similar to that other thing. There's some pattern going on here. The next one that comes in, we say, hey, there's a pattern. Let's stop, and let's get rid of the duplication. Now, I won't go into details about this, but there are many ways duplication happens. And so we have to really pay attention to it. Slightly different implementations often are not seen as duplication in code reviews, because they're not similar enough and the person who's doing the code review hasn't been in it deep enough to understand those patterns. So we never fix those things. That just builds up in our code. Another advantage of the mob program. The thrashing. How do we solve the thrashing problem? There's two ways to solve this problem. Stop it from happening or make it irrelevant. <coughs> and we kind of have both. At first, and even still now, when people come to our work here and they notice that we're all working together, they would think we were in a meeting. So they go, oh, I was going to talk to him, but no, you guys are going to meet him. I'll come back later. So it's like kind of the automatic. Nobody would bother us. Hardly anybody would bother us. But another thing is, even when somebody has to leave the team, there's like this team memory of what we're working on that just keeps going. So that person leaves the team for a little while. They come back an hour later. They're right back in the flow. It doesn't take any time to get back up to speed. We have even had visitors come in. We had a guy fly in from uh, Winnipeg spend the day with us. Within 10 minutes, he was bringing value to the team. And he knew nothing about the software we were writing. He knew some stuff about software development that was really important to us just at that moment. And he was able to see that value. So somebody could get absorbed into doing the work and get up to speed quickly. How long does it take in normal environments to get a new person up to speed where they're bringing value? Sometimes weeks, sometimes months. I was at a place where I spent two months doing exercises and getting trained, sometimes never two months before I was actually able to do any work. So yeah, this just gets that, it lessens the thrashing almost to zero. We had a guy today, his wife's um, <coughs> pregnant, they were gonna go do an ultrasound or whatever they, thing they do. He was gone all day, he's probably the most brilliant guy on the team. We just kept working. Everybody together has enough knowledge to just keep going. And when he comes back tomorrow, he'll be up to speed within 10 minutes as to where we are. Should I stop now? How much more do you have? About five slides. Okay. I'm going to prepare the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing is politics. So politics in companies is a miserable thing. And we can't solve all of it by the mob program. But for one thing, one thing I noticed about politics is that if you're in a company where you're going to get rated, you're going to have a performance review based on how productive you were, you are a little less likely to help somebody else when it will take away from you being able to get your work done. So the politics starts growing around that. If I'm the guy who's always solving problems, and I'm helping other people solve their problems, I'm solving fewer of the problems I'm supposed to be solving. And so that's not necessarily a good thing. We don't have any of that. We're all just working together. Nobody's rated on this team above anybody else in any way. As a matter of fact, I won't go into details of the performance reviews because we're probably being recorded. But, um, <laughs> but the way that we're doing it is quite unique because it's a little different than normal working. Everybody is responsible for the same batch of work. So it's a little different. But we got rid of some of the politics. I just like this picture. So that's why I use some of these pictures, I just like them. Okay, 
nobody brought this one up, but this is a big, so, whoops, sorry. I like to ask this question on these. Are these people going to the meeting or coming from the meeting? <laughs> we can't really tell. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. The problem with meetings is, so what a meeting is usually like, and there's many different kinds of meetings, but what a meeting is usually like is this. We are gathering together to share some information, to make a decision about something, and decide who's going to do some work. That's sort of what a meeting is. <coughs> We're not actually doing any work. We're making some, we're gathering information and deciding some stuff about work. So people will often say, well, but you guys are sitting together all day. You're just doing a meeting all day. Well, what do you call a meeting where you're actually working? <laughs> well, we often call those workshops or um, they used to call them war rooms or um, working meetings. They differentiate between these two kinds of meetings. So I'm talking about the kind of meeting where people have to gather together. Someone's going to go on and on like me about something. And then they're going to make a decision. And as soon as they leave that meeting, like I used to do every Monday morning on that story I told, you're getting out of alignment already. And within, how long did it take, by the way? By, by the time I had more questions and I couldn't, and I was blocked, how long did that take? Was a it a couple hours? By the end of the day, Monday, Tuesday morning, I was completely blown. <laughs> so that's the problem with these meetings. We get, we come together to get some kind of decisions made and get some kind of alignment, and then we go off all misunderstanding what we thought this was supposed to be about. And one person is doing what they thought was right, and someone else is doing what they thought was right. And it's not until they come together for a meeting again that they get realigned. Oh, I was doing the wrong thing. Oh, I thought you were supposed to be doing that. No, no, you were supposed to be doing that. It goes on. We don't have this anymore. We have maybe one or two meetings every now and then to do a retrospective. When our, work, when our product owners come to us, which is usually every day, several times a day, they just sit with us and we just keep working. And we talk about the things we're doing, show them it, talk about what we're gonna do next. It's just working. All right. So we're almost time to go through these real quick. There's this idea of continuous learning. I won't go into the details of these pictures, but we are always learning. And the most, the most valuable learning we're getting is we're getting better at explaining things to each other. So the more senior person is getting better at explaining things to the more junior people. The junior people are getting better quickly at programming much quicker than they would otherwise. And they're learning all about the product. So we won't go too much more into this. I will say we need to have a good sense of humor about mistakes. We're trying to be kind to each other. So usually we'll have to say something like, that was boneheaded, but it's exactly the same way I used to do it. We have to know what we've made those same mistakes. I always warn people about this. If you don't do something well, everybody will know you don't do something well. Right? <laughs> it's no longer hidden that you are not a good, not good with the language you're working with, or not a good at the keyboard, or whatever. Or you just have trouble understanding some programming <laughs> concepts. We'll all be exposed. We pay a lot of attention to health and safety. So you notice that we were moving around a lot. We get up and down a lot. We were never more than 15 minutes at the keyboard every hour and a half. So we're not getting carpal tunnel. Uh, we use hand cleaner or whatever we call that stuff, um, sanitizer all the time so we don't spread diseases around and so on. We won't talk more, much more about this except for sanity. We work at a very sane pace. The pressure is off. We have very little pressure. We work at eight hour a day. In uh, three years I've been there, we haven't gone home after five more than once or maybe twice. We get into eight, we leave at five. I usually give some ideas about this. We'll just skip this, try it at home. Try it here. We're going to try it here somehow. Okay, but I want to talk about this. How we discovered mob programming. I'll tell this really quickly. We, I brought to this company the idea of pair programming, TDD, and some other of these kind of what I, you know, <coughs> continuous integration. All the kinds of things that I know about for making code, um, uh, coding better, getting rid of technical debt. So we were doing it every Friday afternoon, two and a half hour study <laughs> session before we were doing our hour mornings. We still do the Fridays as well. And doing that, in doing code codes, we would pass the keyboard around in a, in a uh, kind of like a similar manner, code dojo manner, with a rotation. So we do the four minute uh, uh, rotation. You almost had to push me down. 
<laughs> um, and so what happened was, we had a job that I kind of put on the back burner. I could see there were a lot of problems with it. The people that were working on it was a contractor and one of our people, and it was awful code. And I didn't want to embarrass anybody by us working on it until the team was really solid working together. So finally we brought it out and said, okay, it's time to get this thing done. And so we went to have a meeting, like we talked about there. Let's look at it, talk about what we need to do, see who needs to do what. And we start passing the keyboard around. So we say, oh, I know where that's in the database. Oh, I know where that code is. I know how that part works. And after about two hours, somebody said, let's keep doing this. So we took another room. You know how with meeting rooms, you've got to go from meeting room to meeting room. You don't get to just stay in the same room all day. And we have like 12 meeting rooms. So we start moving from meeting room to meeting room every two hours. So after about two days of that, we all started saying, well, what is this? Well, we do retrospectives every day or two, sometimes maybe once a week but often every day or two. And in our retrospectives, it was coming up working together on the happy side. And then we have to go from room to room on the other side, or the bad stuff. So we're starting to say, well, what is this that we're doing? And we start calling it mob programming because it's sort of a phrase we've heard before. And that was what happened. After that first day, I went and checked just the other day in Outlook in our system. And I saw that the first day we started doing it, within two or three days, we were doing it all day, every day. And within three weeks, we had found a little closet somewhere, maybe half the size of this room, to make a kind of a permanent room for a while until our boss got the idea that we really were going to do this. And that's what we did. So we sort of just stumbled on it by noticing what was working well for us and paying attention to that. And this is the idea of turning up the good of extreme programming. If something works good, turn it up. Turn it up. This is called strengths-based management. What's working good, do more of that. What's working bad? Ignore it. Ignore it. Just turn up the good. It will overwhelm and the bad will fade away. And that's what we know is happening to us. Okay. So this is what we say. Yeah, that was another animation I did. <laughs> so I like to say, if you're going to adopt but one practice, let it be retrospective. Get good at that. Once you're good at looking at the things that are going on, discovering what's good, and turning up the good, then everything else good will follow. It happened to be for us, it was mob programming. What would it be for you? It'll be whatever's right for your team. We did this because the team saw it and said, let's keep doing it. I didn't say, hey guys, let's learn to do mob programming. I just invented it. I didn't invent it. I noticed it, and the team noticed it. And we all kind of, it's kind of like one of those things where you just look at each other and go, what the heck is this? And it's exactly what happened. We're all going, this is really working well. OK, last slide. Second to the last. Do we recommend mob programming? No, we don't. It's just we're sharing what we do, because people ask. This is what we recommend. Pay attention. Explore. Innovate. Listen carefully to what's going on around you. See and observe. Then reflect to and adjust. If you do that, Lots of good things will happen. If you don't do that, you'll be stuck in the same lousy jobs you have right now. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the idea that no matter how bad your job is, you can make things better. And every time you make something a little bit better, it makes it easier to make something else better. This is the idea of baby steps. So that was it. That's the talk. Thank you.